In recap, we have been, uh, all, all this past month, we have been discussing God and politics. Uh, two topics that tend to make people uncomfortable separately, and when you bring them together, they can get super uncomfortable. We started this series by talking about citizenship and the kingdom of God, and how really there is, a, we, are, we are citizens, first and foremost, in the kingdom of God, that any other citizenship we have is secondary and then subject to that particular citizenship. Secondarily, uh, we talked about priorities that we as Christians, as Christ followers, must have when it comes to how we deal with government entities and situations. The first of these, we said, was expression, freedom of expression and freedom of speech, that we have to prioritize dialogue. Any governmental group or, or institution that is trying to thwart our ability to communicate the Great Commission is coming against, directly against Christianity. And so that has to be a priority issue for us. Then we talked about life as a priority issue. Not life by human standards or human definitions, but life by God's definition. And we were very explicit about how God defines life. Then we talked about genuine justice last week. God's version of justice, not social justice, but the way God portrays justice. That this must be another priority issue. Today we are going to be talking about deception. What a great topic. What a fun topic. I read a story this past week about a boy who broke a barometer in his house while playing basketball indoors. Realizing the trouble he would be in for having broken the implement, he decided to repair it using masking tape and then set it back up on the counter that it had fallen off of. Thinking that he was going to get away with this, he was shocked when his father quite suddenly and unexpectedly confronted him on the issue of who broke the barometer. The boy, in a panic, said, the cats did. The cats knocked it off, which prompted some amazement from the father. To think our cats were so concerned by their error that they got out the masking tape. And devoid of thumbs, they managed to put some rudimentary repairs into order and then went ahead and set it back up on the counter. Who had any idea that felines were so considerate? You've done that, right? You've been caught in a lie. And you've come out and you've, you've realized, I'm caught, there's no way out of this. And so you realize and, and, you know, and you recognize, there's no way for me to avoid what's coming. And so you go ahead and confess. Have you noticed that we live in a culture where that's not happening as often anymore? Particularly with people in power and governmental positions of authority, that when they lie and when they deceive, they shoot out a web of deceit in order to cover their bases and make sure that they are not found out or not held accountable. Today we're going to be discussing lies and getting caught in lies. And a question as we get going is this, do governments ever lie? Why do people lie? Well, sometimes we lie because we've misspoken, but most often lies are intentional. And they're intended to bring us some form of advantage or keep us away from some felt disadvantage or we might call them consequences. Individually, lies can become disruptive. Interpersonally, they can mess up relationships. But what happens when a culture begins a practice of lying? As a culture. What happens when major cultural institutions are all repeating the same lie? What do we make of the fact that these powerful institutions are working together to carry out a set of deceptions? What advantage are they looking for? What disadvantage are they seeking to avoid? Could such deceptions be simply a matter of coincidence? Everybody seems to be deceived all at the same time and all in the same way. Well, it seems unlikely. More probable, perhaps even obvious to keen-eyed observers, is that there is a powerful puppet master pulling the strings on the ruse. One great deceiver, deceiving those who deceive on his behalf. What agency? What sort of entity could be said to have such power and influence? How proficient, how experienced must a deceiver be to hoodwink so many people in such ways? I occasionally meet people who are self-described Christians. And when you suggest that there are ploys in play that are meta-level ploys, that there are these, these deceptions that are taking place on national and international levels, some of these people will respond by saying, that's nuts, that's crazy, it's ridiculous, this is just conspiracy theory. The notion that an elaborate conspiracy to deceive humanity is in play is no theory, at least not if you're a genuine Christian. 
In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, this puppet master is named along with his conspiracy. The dragon, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, listen, who deceives the whole world. What does he do? Deceives the whole world. When I encounter such skepticism about mass level deceptions from another Christian, I earnestly ask them the question, and I do this, what do you suppose the devil's been up to? Like, what's his business? What do you think he's doing right now? Do you think he's just in some fiery chasm poking people with a pitchfork? Because that's part of the elaborate deception, right? That that's what he is all about. This week, we're going to be talking about the political and cultural lies that we are warring against and how we as believers are to spurn lies. Before we visit again the junction of God and government, though, let's pray. Our Lord, our God, you who are true, deliverer. Father, right now as we dip into, again, another week of difficult subject matter, we just want to ask the leading of your Holy Spirit. Uh, Father, would you illuminate your scriptures and bring them, bring them to light in such a way that we don't just hear them, but they set deeply into who we are, that they change our character to better help us reflect you. And Father, I, I pray that we would be a people of truth in the midst of a generation that has, uh, has spurned truth and is embracing lies. Lord, we want to be your people. And so we ask that your message set within us today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, today we're going to start by talking about the nature of deception. And then I want to talk about eight ways in which we are currently being deceived by people and uh, organizations that are powerful in our culture today. And lastly, we're going to talk about the Christian response to lies, contending with lies. Let's start by talking about the nature of deception. How does it feel to be lied to? You've all been lied to before. As I mentioned before, when it comes to certain holiday figures, uh, my, in my household, we tell our children what's what. Uh, Lisa and I decided in early marriage, and we kind of concluded as we talked about this, that uh, we would not lie to our children in this regard. We would tell them, hey, look, it's fun to pretend, um, but we don't, didn't want to put ourselves in the position of telling our kids truths about God and with the same mouth than trying to actively deceive them about the existence of these particular, well, this particular glory-stealing, corporate-created, secular substitute for God's gift of his son, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Now, if you're like, Jesus, you're a spoil sport. Jesus, you're a spoil sport. Ben, you're a spoil sport. <laughs> Sorry, Lord. Um, and you're like, well, that's no fun. Let me suggest that if getting gifts and celebrating Christ's birth needs a fictional distraction in order to be fun, there's something wrong with your children. Our frankness with our children on this matter has occasionally resulted in our children spoiling this elaborate yarns spun by other parents. And you might think, that's terrible, but I think it's hilarious. <laughs> My son Aiden, at four years old, was in a preschool program, and it was December, and I went to pick him up from this Christian preschool program, and the, the uh, teacher said, I need to speak with you for just a moment about something that Aiden did today. And Aiden never got in trouble, <laughs> so I was like, oh no, what's going on? And she pulled me aside, and she says, I need to tell you something your son did in front of all the children. You see, we were drawing pictures and talking about said fictional character. And Aiden stood up on his chair in the middle of the room and said, people, people, they're lying to you. There is no Santa Claus. <laughs> now, I think she was clearly mortified by the experience. I was terribly amused, and I couldn't help barking out a laugh, and, uh, which I, I think probably made her feel a little bit worse. But I just, the thought of my son with that Soylent Green is people moment, you know, <laughs> it just amused me to no end. Well, we got into the car and, and I assured her that I would have a, a talk with Aiden. And so we got in the car and uh, I turned to Aiden and said, hey, buddy, I'm not mad at you. Um, but when it comes to this issue, we have to pretend for the sake of other children. But he didn't like that notion. Uh, I remember he, he, he thought it was terrible that we should remain silent while adults Trusted adults continued to lie to children. In retrospect, I think my son had the right of it. 
I think there's something a little bit noxious, something a little bit unnerving about all of that. Are there such things as harmless lies? We've got a name for this in our culture, right? White lies. And white is to let you know that they're pure. They're from a pure motive. They come from a good place. White lies are not a biblical concept. Polite lies and minor deceptions in small ways, these things are ways in which we show ourselves to be not serious about keeping our word. You might be thinking, wait a minute, but I do it to protect people. It's a lie in everyone's best interest. The reason I lie in this regard is for others. I'm just a good person. Isn't that what every government from world history would say about the lies they perpetrated against their people? We're just doing this for their best interest. You know, if they knew better, they would know this was best for them. You might be thinking, well, what am I supposed to do if I'm forced into a situation where my word will hurt people? Well, use tact, dummy. I know that's kind of ironic, right? If someone asks you what you think of their new haircut and you think it looks terrible, you don't have to say, I think it makes you look like a medieval peasant, All right? You can instead say something like, hmm, I think I prefer it the way it was, or I think of you as having a different hairstyle, and maybe this is just going to take some getting used to. Or you can say, why would you ask me that question? You can't very well change it based on my opinion, right? Now, what's, what's the problem? That might hurt somebody's feelings. Well, is there a benefit to being so honest? Yeah, people come to legitimately value your opinion. Or perhaps they don't ask you your, their, your opinion if they think it might hurt their feelings. Either way, you gain a reputation as being a person of integrity. And I believe God that had that in mind for his people. Deception is serious. How serious is it? Revelation 21 verse 8 says, All liars will be in hell or go to hell. That is, those who perpetually and continually engage in lying, that that's their place, the lake of fire. Good times, right? You can't make this a practice in your life and God just shrug his shoulders and go, oh, well, they did it for good reason. Proverbs 12, verse 22 says, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal faithfully are his delight. Or listen to the way it's described in the psalm. Psalm 101, verse 7. He who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. This idea of being in God's house or losing your position suggests that practicing and participating in deception on a regular basis could cause you to be ousted from your position in God's very family. Now, if you weren't in God's family, whose family would you be in? Jesus had no trouble telling us the answer to this question. Liars. Liars are their father's sons or their father's daughters. Who's your daddy? Loved Arnold Schwarzenegger. Who's your daddy and what does he do? John 8, 43 through 45. Jesus identifies who your father is if you're a liar. Why do you not understand what I'm saying, says Jesus? It's because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Jesus had no trouble mapping out the family affiliation based on issues of truth and lies. And he says as much, the distinction between God's family and the rest of the world hinges on truth, namely the truth of who Jesus is. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. Here's what John says later as he's addressing the churches. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Who controls the whole world? The evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Think of Christ and how Christ is described in the New Testament by contrast to the liar and the father of lies and the evil one who deceives the whole of the world. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. John 17, verse 17. This is Jesus praying to God, and he says of the church, sanctify them in what? In truth. Your word is truth. 
John 8, verse 31 and 32. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Do you get a sense of where God stands on the issue of truth versus lies or deceptions? Now I want to ask you, as a people committed to the truth, What are we to do in an era of profound and prevalent misinformation and outright deception? Let me paint a scenario for you as we're getting started with some of this subject matter. I want to set the stage with a scenario that's seemingly innocuous. You're at work, and you're called into the human resources department, and you're told there's been a complaint about you. You apparently have been using the term yellow. And every time you say yellow, or express that yellow exists, you make people uncomfortable. You see, company policy is that all yellow is to be identified as blue. This is an official request. The corporation has recognized what our government has been actively promoting, that all allusions to the concept of yellow is a crime of hate. Such words are violence, and they shall not be tolerated in this workspace. Please sign this paper to indicate that you have been warned. Now, what do you think in such a situation? You know that yellow exists. You know that yellow isn't blue. But to these people, they're they're serious about this delusion. What will it harm anyone if I just change my language to accommodate company policy? I know that I'm reiterating a falsehood, but who does it hurt, really? Doesn't the Bible command me to live at peace with others insofar as I am able? Our sermon today is entitled Spurning Lies, and I want to leave no doubt as to what I believe the Christian position is with regard to deception and repeating deception. To spurn, spurn is not a word we use very often, right? But spurn, to spurn something is to reject with disdain, to treat something with contempt. A Christ follower must aggressively and intentionally reject lies, particularly lies from those in positions of authority. Let's talk types of deception. Abraham Lincoln is credited with making a statement about deception that has become famous the world over since that time. He said this, You can fool some of the people all of the time, and all of the people some of the time. But you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. Now some historians said, we're not even sure that Abraham Lincoln said this. Of course, course we had no recording devices in this time frame. But what happened was, within a decade of Abraham Lincoln apparently saying this, suddenly marketing campaigns across the country began to use Abraham Lincoln's image and this particular quote to sell their products. They were touting their products and clamoring not to be fooled by the competition. We're the real deal. Everything we make is the absolute best. From clothiers to distilleries to dentists, Tobacco processors, root beers, gimbals, and Macy's, corn oil, ice cream, cereals, and Pillsbury's best flour. Everybody was using this Abraham Lincoln quote. Don't be fooled. Heed the advice of Mr. Lincoln. Don't be, don't be one of the fools who suckered into the other company because we're the real deal. And interesting enough, ironically enough, how are they using his words? To fool people. We are the absolute best. There's none better. Anything else is a fraud. How does a person keep from being fooled? How in the midst of so many lies can we assure that we're not amongst those who are swallowing the lies? Let's begin by thinking about categories of lies. The first type of lie I want to deal with is the overt lie. It's the lie that is right out there that is demonstrably false and everybody knows, but everybody has to act like it's true. I read an account this past week of a man who was describing writing a report for his high school geography class on Czechoslovakia. Have you ever tried to spell Czechoslovakia? (laughs) That is not an easy word. And so the the young man thought, I can can make this whole thing up and nobody's going to second guess me. And so that's what he did. Not interested in doing actual research, the man just brazenly lied and contrived stories and cultural narratives that sounded too outlandish to be made up. He said his favorite moment of the composition was taking the keyboard and just pressing down on letters randomly to create the name of a city. He turned in the report, and he received an A on it. Apparently, the young man was not the only person who didn't feel like putting in the work. The key to the deception, he said, was brazen confidence. Brazen confidence. I say it like I know it. I express it with absolute authority, and people will not doubt me 
because I said it so strongly. In our culture, some lies are out and out falsehoods, spoken with brazen confidence such that people just expect others to buckle and agree. Manifestly evident in our current culture is the belief that gender means absolutely nothing and that a person can change their identity to conform to whatever they feel like they are. Be that a man, a woman, a 60-year-old man deciding that he's a six-year-old girl, a person deciding that she is a cat, or that he is a pony, or that the person sexually identifies as a clown. Those are all real illustrations. These lies are spoken so brazenly, and then you are told that you are to affirm and reiterate these lies, or else there's something wrong with you. You're a bad person. If a four-year-old believes that there's something wrong with his or her body, we are told that a good person affirms that child. Yes, you're probably right. Your body is absolutely wrong. Let us mutilate it for you to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars and fill you with drugs that will cause you with lifelong physiological problems. It's a brazen and inhumane lie. And the whole culture is expected to just go along with it and not say anything or else you're rebuked and chastised by everybody around you or by your, by your corporation. These are overt lies. Have you ever heard the Folk tale of the Emperor's New Clothes, written by Hans Christian Andersen. I've, I've been surprised that a lot of younger people are not familiar with this story, so let me just recount it for you very quickly. Some swindlers arrive at a kingdom known for a monarch who spends lavishly on new outfits. And so these con men claim to be weavers who've developed a new type of cloth that can only be seen by the wise. It's effectively invisible to those who are stupid or incompetent. And the emperor, intrigued by their offer, immediately commissions a suit be made. And these men begin setting about working on empty looms and pretending to weave and stitch and sew. And everyone comes up to see them work, but they're all afraid of outing themselves as fools. And so they continually pretend to be in awe of what is being made. Eventually, they present these clothes to the emperor, who dons this new non-existent outfit. He's naked and then begins walking out in a public procession through town, while everyone either stands silently alongside or oohs and ahs about how beautiful his new clothes are. Everyone's afraid to be deemed a fool or to be called out, and so they're silently or complicitly affirming what's definitely not true. The spell is broken for some when a child blurts out, The emperor is naked! But others, including the emperor, just keep going about their business, taking the child's statement to mean that that child is simply ignorant. Can you see it happening in our culture? How do we avoid being fooled? Speak up. Say what is true. There are objective realities in this world that cannot be altered by any amount of wishful thinking or passionate commitment to reiterating a lie. We have to call it as it is. The more people who speak up, the more quickly the spell is broken. A second type of deception that is perpetrated against us is what we would call half-truths. It's been said that if Jesus, uh, or if our modern media rather, were to offer a news report on Jesus' miracle of walking on the water, the headline would probably read, Can the Son of Man even swim? Or, Galilean caught in overt water phobia. Right? They take a story, and then you turn it in such a way as to make it volatile for one person and to claim authority for another particular side. More common than overt lies are the more subtle deceptions we might describe as narrative control. The journalist takes a fact, and then they build up an entire story, the story that they want to tell from the fact. Generally speaking, telling the whole story becomes problematic. So facts are selected to support the narrator's premise and other facts are ignored in order to create the story that the author wants to tell. This cultural phenomenon is actually the result of a particularly pernicious worldview of philosophy known as postmodernism. Postmodernism holds that there aren't any real truths and there aren't any real lies, there are only stories. And so a person can tell a story, there are strong stories and there are weak stories, and if you want to be held as reputable, you tell the strongest story. This is what our whole media has been fed on and what our whole media is engaged in right now, telling the strongest story so that they can be seen as true. How do we avoid being fooled by half-truths? Well, search for the whole story. Find the unedited interview. 
Have you noticed how they'll snipe particular statements that people make and they pull them entirely out of context? Look for context beyond simple explanations or the easy explanation. A third type of deception that is being perpetrated against us is perspective manipulation. There's a very funny series of YouTube videos uh, that are movies without music. I encourage you to look them up. They're hilarious. What they do is they take these iconic movie scenes that you've all probably witnessed, and they just remove the soundtrack. And something that seems so emotional and amazing is suddenly very stilted and awkward as soon as you remove the music. Very funny stuff. But what it demonstrates is this. It demonstrates how elaborate, how different an experience can be if an editor meticulously controls the ambiance and image selection. Do you know that's happening to us constantly? Have you ever noticed how some images in music tell a story beyond the words? Pay close attention to images that the news is showing you. If they show a picture of a person and that person's mouth is open, making them look like an idiot, or if they look considerably angry, that wasn't selected by accident. That was an editorial choice that someone made. They're trying to make you feel a certain way about that person. If the music or the lighting is less than flattering, that was a narrative decision someone made because they're trying to control how you feel about the person being framed. So how do you avoid being fooled? Assume regardless of what information you're taking in that you are being manipulated. With that in mind, lean in against the manipulation. If you see that they want you to dislike somebody, lean against it and try to discern with more objective framework. A fourth category of deception, fake news. In 2014, Rolling Stone magazine published an article in which it recounted the horrific details of a woman's story of having been raped in a public university. The problem with the article and with the story was that it was completely contrived. It was absolutely false, entirely made up. Now, when it was discovered that this story was a lie, what should have happened? Well, the whole of the community should have condemned the lie, and they should have condemned the liar, and the magazine that published the lie. However, is that what happened? The media ran interference for the lies or got entirely silent on the particular issue and didn't spell anything out about it. And when questioned on this matter, they said it didn't really matter that it wasn't true. What matters is that we raise awareness. You see, the lie is for good reason. It's justifiable. It's going to help everyone. According to political science professor Wilfred Riley, who's written extensively on hoax hate crimes, uh, that would be hate crimes that are perpetrated by usually the person who is pretending to be the one victimized by the hate crime, or of the same ethnicity, or the same political group. Of a database of 346 hate crimes and allegations, um, Wilfred studied, he, he said that only one-third were actually legitimate. Probably less than one-third. Does the media care if it misreports on these matters? No, not really. They can publish a retraction quietly on their website that no one's going to read, and they're largely held unaccountable. They care about telling the story, the sensational story. Fake news it's weird. Like a decade ago, none of us even said that phrase, right? Uh, and for most of us, this was not a phrase we'd even ever heard. Now it's hard to go a day or a week without having heard it somewhere, right? Fake news was initially a description of the biased reporting and lying that we've been discussing this whole sermon so far, but now fake news has become a method of discrediting any other opinion other than yours. And so fake news is actually a means of producing fake news about real news. So you say, that's fake news, even if it's real, and then suddenly it can be disregarded. It's fake, fake, fake news. A little confusing? Yes. Uh, how do we avoid being fooled? Well, investigation helps. The kind that takes more than a quick internet search. As a default position, it's probably best to regard most claims as fake on some level, especially claims if they deal with the government or come through media sources. And you might be thinking, Doubting your government, that's un-American. No, it's not. It's precisely American. This is exactly how this country was founded, with an ideology that said, you should discredit and disregard a government. You should assume that the government doesn't have your best interests in mind, and that's how we were meant to approach our government. A fifth type of lie is sensationalized reality. I'll pick on my son Aiden again. My, 
My son Aiden was taking, uh, he started college courses while a junior in high school. And so at 16 years old, he was having to do a speech, an introductory speech to, of, of himself in a public speaking course down at UC. And so he was thinking through what he would do with this particular topic and how he would make it snazzy and grasp interest right away. And so here's how he started his public speaking introduction of self. Can the Sasquatch communicate telepathically? At this point, everyone zeroed in on all the students who were looking around, what are we going to talk about? And then he followed it up with, we may never know, but what I know is I'm Aiden Walker. And then he proceeded to go ahead and give, <laughs> give his speech. Uh, but then he ended his speech with this. He said, anybody who does you know, have any insights regarding the telepathic capabilities of Sasquatch, you can send them to me at mindsquatch at gmail.com. <laughs> A web, <laughs> an a, a email address that he had created for just that speech. Proud dad moment there. But, you know, you know it, does, it tells us something, it tells us a lot about what we do as a culture on a regular basis. We all gravitate toward the most bizarre and outlandish stories we can find, don't we? The term clickbait has emerged surrounding this phenomenon. Journalists, media outlets know that the more sensational the headline the more disturbing the image, the more likely someone's going to click to see what it's about. And clicks equal money for most of these outlets. So they continue to be super hyperbolic in the way they're dealing with information. The problem with this tendency is that most of our news, is, news organizations, most of the internet organizations tend to be negative and often ridiculously so. Fear is a very strong motivator. It gets those clicks. And we've witnessed this in force during this COVID pandemic, haven't we? Fear every day, just a glut of fear and, and all this information that is coming your way that is doom and gloom and tries to help you with certain that the end of the world has come upon you. If you go outside and breathe, you're going to die. How do we avoid being fooled? Presume that most stories you read are significantly less crazy than the headline suggests. Recognize Christ follower that the world is not going to hell in a handbasket, at least not with you in it. It might be headed there, but your salvation is secure. And so the worst that this world can throw at you, the worst things that can happen here are still not going to disturb your eternity. A sixth type of disinformation that the government throws at us is echo chamber information. Do you remember when news used to be primarily about reporting facts? It wasn't all that long ago, right? Most news outlets now make a practice of not telling you what happened, but rather telling you how to think about what happened. You're entering into the story, not hearing the story, but hearing an argument about the story, or at least one side of the argument. How do you not get fooled? Try to know the arguments against any position you're inclined to take. Know the other side. Know it better than people who know the other side. A seventh type of disinformation that comes our way is fact-checking. It felt good when fact-checking first emerged. It's like, oh, cool, somebody is going to hold these people to account. But perhaps the most insidious liars are the organizations that now claim to be third-party fact-checkers. I don't know if you've ever looked into this or not, but the vast majority of these organizations are actually owned by the parent companies of the organizations and groups that they're apparently fact-checking. It's just another layer of deception. And it, it, I've gotten to the point where if I'm on Facebook and I see this, you know, this article has been fact-checked, I'm immediately like, this is probably a good article. That's my the initial response because when it comes down that far, you recognize, man, they're just going to lie to me in another fashion. How do you keep from being fooled? Read the so-called fact-checks to see whether they address the actual issue at stake. Here's what you're going to find. And fact-checkers know this. They know that all they have to do is present something that says this has been fact-checked and discovered to be false. And the vast majority of people will never actually read to see what they consider false. If you actually go to those articles, here's what you'll find. A lot of the time they go, well, you know, all this stuff is true, but this one little detail uh, is debatable. And so the whole thing they just say is false. That's a lie. <laughs> that is a considerable lie. How do we keep from being fooled? Well, check out the fact-checks. Lastly, shutting down opposition views. This is probably the most pernicious uh, particular set of deceptions that are occurring in our culture, shutting down other views. 
Statements like, the science is settled, should strike you as incredibly absurd. That is not how science works. Science, we don't just go, oh, we found the answer. Everybody stop asking questions. That's not how science should be conducted. When any individual or any group says, oh, by the way, we're shutting down all argument on this particular issue, that should raise all kinds of alarms for you. That is an announcement of opposition suppression. This is what tyrannical, ideologically tyrannical governments do. Whenever you hear that being the case, you need to stop and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Open up the debate. No, 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 we're here for argument. We want to hear every side of this issue. How do we keep from being fooled? Refuse to be bullied or threatened in a silence or compliance. As soon as any side begins to try to deplatform or silence or otherwise mute its opposition through force, through threat, or through legal action, you can pretty much assume that the side that is using such tactics is trying to hedge its lies. Assume that they're in the wrong. Okay, let's talk about how to deal with this as Christians, contending with lies as Christ followers. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the um, journalist who wrote extensively telling the, the evils of the Communist Party, in 1974, just before he was expelled from the USSR, wrote an essay. And the essay was written to a people group who knew that the Communists now had complete and total control. And so they were in a position where they were going to have to either embrace the lies, endorse the lies, or be subject to their government's criticism. But to speak out at this point in history would mean your death sentence. Here's what Solzhenitsyn said. He said, the young and presumptuous people who thought they would make our country just and happy through terror, bloody rebellion, and civil war were themselves misled. No thanks, fathers of education. Now we know that infamous methods breed infamous results. Let us have clean hands or let our hands be clean. The circle, is it closed? In other words, do the communists absolutely control the ideologies now? The circle, is it closed? And is there really no way out? And is there only one thing left for us to do to wait without taking action? Maybe something will happen by itself. It will never happen as long as we delay acknowledgement, extol and strengthen we do not sever ourselves from the most perceptible of the encirclement's aspect, lies. Unless we sever ourselves from lies, this will just grow stronger and stronger. He said this, and the simplest and most accessible key to our self-neglected liberation lies right here. Personal non-participation in lies. Though lies conceal everything, though lies embrace everything, we will be obstinate in the smallest of matters. Let them embrace everything, but not with any help from me. This opens a breach in the imaginary encirclement caused by our inaction. It is the easiest thing to do for us, the most devastating for the lies. Because when the people renounce lies, it simply cuts short their existence. Like an infection, they can only exist on a living organism. Let us refuse to say that which we do not think. So he went on to say, what happens when someone comes into your store and you are meant to express or, uh, or articulate something that the Communist Party has told you you have to say. He says, you remain silent and just stare. If they've told you to put up a poster, don't put it up. Put it underneath the counter. Do not participate in lies. What does this mean for us? Let me just give some principles that Christians need to maintain along these lines. Number one, stop being a coward, Christian. Stop being a coward. Let me take you back to Revelation 21.8, this passage that details the types of people who are going to hell. Listen to this. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice the magic arts and idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Did you notice how that list started? With cowardly and ended with liars. What are you afraid of? Alexander Solzhenitsyn and his Christian contemporaries faced down a violent death at the behest of their ideological counterparts. What are you facing down? What's so terrifying to you about speaking up in this culture? Will someone ridicule you? They might laugh at us. They might think I'm foolish. Satan has no reason to employ violence against the church when the most minor shame will make the church close its collective mouths for fear of being thought silly by the devil's pawns. Jeremiah the prophet was commanded to speak against the government and against the powers and the people in his nation. 
Listen to what God said to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 17 through 19. Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah and its officials and its priests and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you to rescue you, declares the Lord. An iron pillar, a fortified city, a bronze wall. Is that what you think of when you think of the church in North America? Does the church of our day seem to be this collective, immovable, and alterable people devoted to speaking and living the truth? Over the past decades, I feel like the church has grown increasingly soft and timid in the face of social pressures. With so-called members of the church doing the work of the adversary by policing and shaming other Christians for not being gentle enough, and by gentle, what do they mean? They mean compliant. They mean silent. So as not to let the world know that there are any alternatives to what's being said. Do we have the truth or not? Amen, we do. So what are we afraid of? Are we afraid of being foolish? Afraid of losing our comforts? Afraid of being killed? Hey, we know that we're going to think we're fools. The scripture promised us that. The purpose of life is not comfort. And we know what happens when we die. Church, toughen up. Speak out. Say something. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. Here's what Paul says to his disciple, Timothy. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, listen, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Remember your lineage, Christ follower that you receive this gospel from other truth-tellers and be a truth-teller yourself. What is the cost of submission and silence? Let me ask it this way. How does an ideological tyranny occur? You might think it happens as the result of powerful people and institutions working hard to bring a culture to heal, but it's less about powerful people and institutions than it is about the small people they're trying to deceive. Ideological tyranny only works if good people repeat the mantras of those who are in power and good people go quiet for fear of reprisals. You, individual in this room, may be the only hope of breaking that spell for somebody in your circle of influence. Tell the truth. Question the truths that are being handed to you by the government and by media groups and by policymakers. If you saw a stranger in your home attempting to destroy your children or grandchildren or coerce them into some heinous act, my guess is that every virtuous person in this room would do everything in their power to destroy the destroyer before he commits that act of evil. And yet we allow equally insidious people into our homes, into our lives, into the lives of our children every day, Voices that come through your TV, your devices, the talking heads on the internet, the talking heads in Washington, the talking heads through big tech and big pharma. If we don't guide our families and friends in recognizing that they are drinking unwittingly from a sewer of lies, we're handing them over to destruction as surely as if we watch the stranger walk into our homes and victimize those we love. I'm not suggesting to you that we hide from the world. In fact, I would say you're in the spiritual wrong if you hide from the world. What I'm suggesting to you is that your family and your friends, everyone around you sees you systematically dismantling the lies. You show them how it's done in your person, the way you behave and the way you talk. At minimum, exert the influence to call lies out. So be courageous. Secondly, Christ follower, demonstrate healthy skepticism. This needs to be a personal posture that every Christian has. Teach those around you by example of asking difficult questions. Why do you believe that? Where did that thought come from? Is that yours? Is that based historically? Are there a people group who believed this 100 years ago? Why would you hold to this? What is your evidence for this? What are your sources for this? Be that person. And you might think, that person's annoying. Be annoying. Right? We have to ask difficult questions. We have to assert that people understand that they're swallowing whole cloth lies and, and repeating and regurgitating those lies. And unless somebody stops it, it's just going to continue and get worse. Train those around you, those you love. Parents in particular, and especially you guys who are going to be having kids in the next couple of years. 
You'll either teach your kids to navigate in this regard, or you're turning them over as prey to the world. Be discerning. Don't tell them how to think. Show them how to think. Teach them how to engage critically with the world around them. Also, as a position of healthy skepticism, doubt news that you want to hear. Um, there, there's a tendency in a lot of Christians to hear what they want to hear, and they just swallow it whole cloth. Recognize good disinformation, and by good disinformation, I mean the pernicious, awful kind, doesn't just tell you uh, lies that it is assuming that you're going to reject, but it tells you lies you want to hear to make you foolish. Don't accept everything you hear just because it came from a Christian source or source that you endorse. Be courageous, be a healthy skeptic. Thirdly, discern and declare. When you find actual lies, call them out for what they are. Ephesians 4 verse 25 says, laying aside all falsehood, speak truth, of you, speak truth to each one of you with his neighbor. For we are all members of one another. When you catch your government, your politicians, your media, your culture lying, converse with others about it. One of the church's greatest advantages over our enemy is community. I'll say that again. One of our greatest advantages over the enemy is community. We're surrounded by a fellowship of believers. If you're not involved in a Bible study where you can talk to people about what's going on in the world, you need to be involved in one of those. If you don't have a sphere of influence among other Christians, you can talk to about lies that you're seeing coming regularly through the media. Find that. When you find a lie, talk to other people about it. Why? So we can disseminate the information and together we will not be fooled. Beware of liars who claim Christianity. I'll just briefly mention this. 2 Peter chapter 2. Um, we're told, Peter tells us that many will follow their sensuality because of the ways, uh, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. In their greed, they'll exploit you with false words. Their judgment is from long ago and is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. The enemy has agents in the church. Assume it's the case. And those agents usually are not like, hey, we should all worship Satan. Those agents tend to just mollify and diminish and try to weasel in certain ideas. When you encounter that in the church, follow the Matthew 18 model for addressing them, calling them out on their sin, that you might restore them, and if not restore them, that we might oust them. Fourthly, a Christ follower must refuse to echo. As souls and eats and said, live not by lies. Refuse to give voice to that which you know is playing into the enemy hands. Or the enemy's hands. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and having put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Do not echo lies. If you repeat lies just because it gives you cultural advantage, you have become a liar. Do not vote for those who repeat lies. Do not endorse those who play politics by speaking out of both sides of their mouths or who accommodate or offer inclusion to known deceptions. As we close out today, I just want to give you an image uh, to think about in this regard. With regard to the deception issue, uh, you watch nature specials probably. You've all seen a pride of lions going about and killing uh, animals. And a small pride of lions can send a, a herd of thousands of, uh, of uh, Cape buffalo running. And you've probably seen that. They pick out the weak ones, they get the weak ones, they drag them down, they eat them. You know, a Cape buffalo is very capable of killing a lion. Individually and collectively. But because there's a small group chasing them and they all don't know who's going to be victimized, they tend to run. But have you ever seen the nature specials where there's that moment where a herd is moving away and running away from a small group of lions and all of a sudden one of the males turns around and stops. And he stands his ground. And then others swim, swim in beside him and they're all standing there. And they lower their heads and they just get ready. And pretty soon this wall of horns and muscle that is standing there, it doesn't just terrify the lions. The lions aren't just coming any closer, but suddenly the wall starts moving toward the lions and begins to shut down those who thought they were the predators. They are now becoming the prey. There are a number of videos, I watched several this week, where a group of water buffalo do this and they go in and they kill the lions. When it comes to lies, stand your ground. Others will rush up beside you and they will stand with you. But unless the church does this, we will buckle in this culture and we will lose Christianity in this generation. Let's go to our master in prayer.
our Lord and God, we ask that you help us to be a people of truth. That no matter what comes our way, no matter what the culture deems to be the lie of choice, the lie du jour, Father, that we, we will stand against government, against powers and principalities, that we will stand as your people and stand in truth. May it be the case for each and every believer in this room. It's in your name we pray. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.